welcome to our event, Exploring the Life and Work of Judith Ackland and Mary Stella Edwards. Um, I'm Ellie Coleman. I'm Engagement Officer at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, and I'm also one of the co-directors of the project, alongside Professor Jana Funke and Natalie McGrath. So before we begin, I just wanted to run through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone's mic should be muted while others are speaking, just so we don't get any interference. Um, please feel free to turn on your video if you're comfortable doing so. We always like to see your friendly faces. There's going to be time for questions at the end of the speakers section. So if you think of a question you'd like to ask anybody, um, could you please write it in the chat box to the right of your screen? And could I ask that you also put a queue in front of it, just it makes it easier for me to find. We're going to be recording the main part of this event and you will hopefully have just consented to that in, when you um, logged on. Um, but we're going to turn off the recording when we get to the Q&A section. OK, so I'm just going to start by giving a bit of an introduction about the Out and About project. So it's a two year project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and it builds on previous work that Jana and Natalie have done with RAM over the past couple of years, which was particularly focused on working with young LGBTQ plus people. The funding from NLHF has meant that we can build on this brilliant foundation to create a much wider reaching project involving more people and making a real impact. I'm going to put a link down in the chat box in a minute to the project website where you'll be able to find out more about what we've been up to so far and our future ambitions. So you'll see when you visit the website that there's lots of elements to the project, including artist commissions, working with research volunteers, working with young people, events, building a new interactive for one of RAM's spaces, brilliant work from our writer in residence, a blog and a queer collector's case. And our main ambition for the project is to ensure that LGBTQ plus people feel welcomed and well represented at RAM. Until recently, museums have not actively created space for queer, trans and non-binary people. LGBTQ plus voices are often missing and unheard in interpretation materials, viewpoints and selections of objects. So through this project, we want to address this imbalance and instead express and celebrate LGBTQ plus heritage. Um, there's a few collectors, producers and donors of objects to RAM who've become important figures in the Out and About project, who have ignited a particular interest from the wider team. So figures such as Ivor Treby, who some of you might be familiar with if you've been um, following the project for a while, um, he was a biochemist, a poet and an activist who donated a large collection of sand samples to RAM. At the time, RAM's curators knew very little about Treby, so it was a bit of a mystery donation. Um, some of the samples were added to the collection based on their geological merit and others were uncatalogued. And one of the out and about commissioned artists, Caleb Parkin, became interested in Treby's sand collection and has been digging deeper into his story and making creative responses to the objects. So through this work, we've uncovered fantastic queer narratives and responses that would otherwise have been unheard. Ackland and Edwards have become similarly important figures in the project, with a number of project researchers taking interest in their work and lives. And again, Ram doesn't have a huge amount of information about them. Um, we hold a number of paintings by Ackland and Edwards, which were donated to Ram by Edwards throughout the mid 70s to 80s. And I think Jana's gonna tell you a bit more about those in a moment. I just also wanted to say that a lot of the new information and narratives that are uncovered through the work of the researchers and our other project partners are going to be added to the narrative that Ram holds about Ackland and Edwards. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what the speakers this evening have to say about the lives of these two intriguing people. I'm going to pass over to Jana now. Yes, thank you so much, Ellie, for the great introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm going to share my slides, and I hope this works. So I hope everyone can see our lovely logo, which was designed by Frank Duffy. And I would encourage everyone to check out their work. So I'm really, as Ellie said, really, really excited to spend this evening with all of you to think about and to really honor the life and work of Judith Eklund and Mary Stella Edwards. Um, as Ellie said, both of them have been a really important part of this project from the very beginning. And it's really exciting to bring together experts and people with a great interest in their life and work tonight to talk about um, their art um, and, and their lives. So we're really going to tonight think about Eklund and Edwards from a range of different perspectives. So both through research and also through creative responses. 
And to do that, um, I will talk very briefly about the wider framing of the project and also show you some of the paintings and a very intriguing sculpture of sorts that the REM hold. Um, but then I'm going to hand over to um, the real experts and the people who've done work on Edwards um, and Eklund. So first of all, we're going to hear from Nicole Hicken and I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers now. So Nicole is a curatorial assistant and museum coordinator coordinator at the Burton at Biddeford Art Gallery and Museum. And the Burton hold the largest collections, as far as I know, of Eklund's and Edwards paintings and also their archive. And Nicole has a, done a lot of really pioneering work on the archive and on the collections and is here to talk to us tonight about her work and really offer us that insight, which is, which is really, really exciting. The next speaker will be Emma Wallace, who is one of the research volunteers on the Out and About project. As Ellie said, the researchers are doing vital work as part of this project, and I'm really grateful that Emma is here uh, to join us tonight. So Emma is a recent English literature graduate from the University of Exeter with an interest in queer ecology and the natural world. Um, Emma has already written a really amazing blog on Mary Enning, who some of you might know from the recent film Emma Knight, or you might have come across her work in uh, at the REM or other local museums. And um, that blog really explores queer history in very interesting ways. Um, and I will put the link in the chat later. But today, uh, Emma is here to talk to us about the role of queer ecology and the natural world in Eklund's and Edwards paintings because landscapes were such a central motive in their, their painting. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. Our third speaker is Helen Kent, who has worked as a journalist and television producer and also has a lot of experience working in educational support. And Helen is also an expert on Eklund and Edwards, having written an MA dissertation on them. And Helen is currently working on a creative PhD thesis that explores Edwards and Eklund's life, focusing specifically on their cabin. And you will hear a lot about this Myth, mythical cabin uh, over the course of this event. It's a very special place. Last but not least, Natalie McGrath will share her creative response to Eklund and Edwards. This is a work in progress that Natalie is writing as part of her work on this project. So many of you will know Natalie. She is such an integral part to this project, to the Out and About project. She is uh, a co-director. She is a writer in residence at REM, and she's also our creative heritage producer. And beyond that, Natalie is the co-director of Dreadnought Southwest. She's a very experienced playwright and writer also an occasional performer. And Natalie is very, very busy right now because one of her plays um, we'll meet in Moscow is about to be performed at the Travers Theater in Edinburgh, which is really amazing. So there's loads going on and I'm really thrilled that Natalie is here with us tonight as well. So we have a very rich evening with loads of different speakers talking about Eklund and Edwards from different perspectives. So I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, I'm going to offer a very brief biographical uh, introduction, even though Nicole will go into much more detail later. But just so that people who might never have heard of Eklund and Edwards before know who they are. So Mary Stella Edwards was born um, in 1898, educated in Ashford, then studied art at the Battersea and at Regent Street Polytechnic, which is now the University of Westminster, I believe. And it is here that she met Judith and after meeting the two women would spend their lives together five decades from the 1920s to Judith's death in 1971. Judith Eklund was born in Biddeford in North Devon in 1892, attended art school in Biddeford, and then also went to Regent Street Polytechnic in London, where the two women met. And I first heard about Eklund and Edwards in 2017, when I met someone who had volunteered at the Burton Art Gallery and Museum. And she knew that I was interested in queer histories in the Southwest. And she said, there's this couple and people don't really know how to talk about them, but you will be interested in them. And I kind of kept that in mind. And then when Natalie and I developed the project with REM, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, I was really delighted to find out that the REM also holds some of Eklund's and Edward's paintings. And I will show you some of them on the slide now. There are some that haven't been digitized yet, um, so they're not in the catalog and we don't have very good images of them, but this is just a selection. So this is quite an early painting by Eklund, um, a costume study, and quite unusual because the other paintings that um, Rem hold are predominantly landscapes. 
So these are some other examples. Um, on the right, you can see the cabin um, in Bucks Mills. Uh, it's a really lovely painting. Um, some other landscapes here, just to give you an impression of the work. Uh, another one from Dartmoor. Really lovely. Natalie and I went to the um, the ARC, the storage facility, a few uh, weeks ago and saw them, the real paintings, which was really, really interesting. So these are some of Mary Stella Edwards' paintings. Um, and this, I think, is Natalie's my favorite, which is a seaweed. And it's entitled Left by the Tide, which is really, really beautiful. And those colors are really striking as well. So as promised, this is the slightly more curious object, which the Ram also own. So I'm sure Nicole and Helen might be able to say more about this, but uh, as far as I know, Eklund developed a, a new method or technique to develop miniatures and to make models in the 40s. And I think this is one of the models that was sold to the Ram, probably because of the, 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 the royal connection with Prince Albert, um, who the museum is, is meant to commemorate. And I assume that's why the Ram bought bought this, um, it's, it's cataloged as a sculpture, and it was really funny to see this. Um, but I mean, lovely detail and really, really intriguing to see. In addition to this, and this is something I'm particularly interested in, I'm not an art historian, I'm a literary scholar and a historian of sexuality. And I'm really interested in the fact that Mary Stella Edwards was also a published poet. And I've been reading some of her, her poetry recently, which is really, really interesting as well. So you can see here some of the poetry collections that she published. I will say more about Time and Chance, the first poetry collection published in the 1920s later on. And then you see there's a four decade gap. During this time, uh, Mary Stella Edwards continued to publish poems in journals. Some of them were very well established journals. So she published in the Contemporary Review, in the Nation and Athenaeum, for instance. So her poetry was quite well received and published in very kind of prestigious places at times as well. In terms of themes, it's quite interesting. I mean, some of the poems resonate with the paintings in very obvious ways. I mean, there's a lot about rural and coastal landscapes, um, including um, North Devon, but there are also very deep meditations on time and temporality that I think cut across a lot of the, the poems. And you can even see this in the titles of the collections here. Um, there's a particular theme, I think, around that tension between the ephemeral, the fleeting, the present moment, and that which remains, which is stable, which is possibly even eternal. And this theme of temporality takes on a particular significance in the poems which Edwards writes after Eklund's death in 1971. Um, so in particular, the collection before and after, um, basically the titles refers to that temporal break when Eklund dies, so before and after her death. And that collection really deals in, in deeply moving ways with themes around grief, memory, loss, mourning, but also celebrating Eklund's and the memories that the two women had, had shared over, over five decades. I will read one of those poems later on to conclude my talk. Um, so having introduced some aspects of their work and life, and you will hear much more later on, I want to briefly reflect on the place of Edwards and Eklund's on our project, which is about querying the Rams collections and uncovering previously hidden or obscure uh, aspects of LGBTQ plus history and heritage. And as, as Ellie said, um, it's fair to say that within the Ram at least, Eklund and Edwards haven't really yet been explored as artists who are part of queer history. And so we are really excited that our work um, can begin to, to do this. It is important to stress though that we are not the first or only project to begin to consider Eklund and Edwards as part of queer history. So in recent years, um, their relationship has repeatedly been written about as an intimate or loving lifelong relationship or partnership. And it has been described by others using the label queer or LGBTQ. Uh, and a lot of this work has focused on the cabin in Bucks Mills, which I mentioned earlier, which is where Eklund and Edwards spent their summers together. And we will hear more about this place later on. But in uh, 2017, Historic England included the cabin uh, in their Pride of Place project. So uh, it was recognized as a grade two listed building and celebrated as part of an LGBTQ plus heritage project. And the National Trust who now own the cabin also included Eklund and Edwards that same year in a podcast they did around the queer heritage associated with their properties, which was um, 
hosted by Claire Balding. And just a few weeks ago, actually, for Pride Month in June, the National Trust tweeted the image that you can see on the, on the, on the slide, which basically shows the Pride flag, the Progress Pride flag, and the white color on the flag is taken from the whitewashed walls in Ecklands and Edwards Cabin. So again, celebrating them in the co context of a Pride LGBTQ plus project. And I think this work is vitally important. Um, queer people and queer women in particular have often been erased from history. And one of the reasons we are doing this work on the Out and About project is to push against these and other forms of historical erasure. And I really believe in the importance and value of telling our stories and demonstrating that collections like the one we have at REM are not as straight or cisgender as some people might initially assume. At the same time, it is also important and actually interesting to ask questions about what it means to use a term like queer to talk about people who, as far as I know, did not use this language themselves. So as far as I know, and I have not done work on the archives, I'm happy to be corrected, but my impression is that Eklund and Edwards did not publicly claim a specific label for themselves uh, or for their relationship, which is something they could have done. So even in the 1920s, there was a rich vocabulary available to talk about same-sex desire between women. So they might have talked about sapphism or they might have talked about inversion, which were terms that were used at the time. And of course, Eklund and Edwards did live into the 70s and 80s. They did live into what some people might call a post-gay liberation moment when terms like gay, lesbian were even more widely accessible in the UK and other countries. And so it is important to note and acknowledge that they did not choose to identify with this language, at least as far as I know, or at least not publicly. Um, thinking about this and the wider kind of queer cultures that they might have been or could have been part of, it's also interesting that Edwards published her first collection of poetry, which I mentioned earlier, Time and Chance, in 1926 with the Hogarth Press, which was famously owned and run by Virginia and Leonard Wolf. The Wolves were, of course, at heart of the Bloomsbury Group, central to high modernist elite literary circles, which Edwards was at least adjacent to in that moment of her life. And these were also deeply queer circles. Wolf, of, of course, had a, a sexual and intimate relationship with the writer and gardener Vita Sackville West, as many of you will know. And interestingly, Edward's poetry collection, Time and Chance, was also introduced by the Cambridge scholar Gilbert Murray, who was close friends with another Cambridge classicist, Jane Harrison, who was in a very close intimate partnership with the female poet Hope Merlees. And Wolf knew Harrison, published Merlees. So again, these are interconnected circles and, and networks. Um, and so I find it very interesting that Edwards was at least in the 1920s connected to these circles, but for whatever reason, she chose not to fully embrace or integrate herself into these queer artistic networks. And I would love to find out more about why she might have made that choice, if it was a choice, but there is something significant in terms of how we remember this life, um, that, that Eklund and Edwards carved, a life, carved out a life for themselves away from these queer avant-garde elite circles in London, choosing to focus much of their life and work onto rural and natural spaces, including North Devon. And one of the joys of working on them is that there is this indeterminacy and, and a lack of certainty in what language we should use, which I find fascinating. And also the way in which it allows us to think about queerness, not just focused on the big cities, London, Berlin, Paris, but also thinking about rural and natural spaces and the potential they might hold for queer people. So in a sense, what we need here is a queer way of looking at their life and work that acknowledges these complexities while also making it possible for us to honor and make visible the intimacy and love that Edwards and Eklund shared for five decades. And so in a sense, we are using the term queer on this project in a very open, capacious sense. Um, we are using the term queer to describe anyone or any relationship that does not fit any given norms or expectations regarding gender or sexuality. So the fact that Eklund and Edwards did not get married to men, that they chose to live their lives together, that makes them queer in a broad sense, in a capacious sense, and then allows us to ask questions about and also to honor the love, intimacy, collaboration, partnership that shaped their lives for so many decades. 
And that is also expressed so powerfully in the many traces they left behind for us, including their paintings, the poetry, and also the cabin. So you will hear more about the cabin later. These are some pictures I took on a gloomy day when I first visited the cabin. But you can see, for instance, the initials above the door. So that's a sign that we can interpret in particular ways. Um, the women also painted each other. So there's an intimacy expressed in painting. And then, as I said, the poetry. Um, Edwards dedicated several of her collections to Eklund and very explicitly wrote about um, their domestic life together, the love they shared, and then also the grief and the loss that she experienced after Judith's death. So to conclude, I'm going to briefly read this poem to give you a sense of that intimacy and the, the care and love that is expressed here. It's a very difficult poem to read in terms of the rhythm, there's strange pauses and breaks. I'll do my best, but you can also read it on the slides. So this poem is about the last Christmas that they spent together before Judith's death in 1971. I celebrate these 50 years and one of more than Jubilee, where time is made no mark on all begun in that so lovingly remembered then, save growth as in a tree. The deeper roots, the flowering branches spread, embracing earth and sky, keep the same stars whose shine is ever shed, through the twigs net, safe in that leafy pen, though night and morning die. They are more constant bright than any seen by other lifted eyes. Their light is ours and is, though it has been a beam in space since that far changeless, then the heart's still richest prize. So I'll stop here um, and very happy to discuss all of this further. But I will now hand over to Nicole, our next speaker. And I'm going to share your slides now. And I hope this works. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm the um, curatorial assistant and museum coordinator at the Burton Art Gallery and Museum. I've been working with the Ackland and Art. Edward's archive at the Burton since it came into our collection. And it's really great to be able to share with you a bit more of an insight into Judith Ackland and Mary Stella Edwards. So I normally call them Judith and Mary Stella because I kind of work with them every day. So we're on first name terms. Um, if you want to do the next slide, please. <laughs> um, so this is just an introduction, if you like, to what we have learnt at the Burton through working with the Ackland and Edward Archive and the Ackland and Edwards Trust over the last seven or eight years. I'm hoping to share an insight into some of the discoveries myself and volunteers have made during the time that we've been working on the archive and give you a feel for Judith and Mary Stella as individuals and partners. The archive is compact but extensive and it has taken us a long time to do a primary assessment of it so what we can so that we can get to the interesting part of telling um, their stories pulling it to apart and putting it all back together again we have been limited in some part by the editing of diaries and letters by Mary Stella prior to her death in the 1980s. It's still unclear why this was done, but it is clear from what remains that her focus for the archive was to record both her professional lives as writers and artists. The further we delve into the archive, the more our understanding of their relationship to each other grows. Now the next slide, please. Yes. Um, I'll just read the quote for you. I have just read in the paper a description of spring already come in the West, but makes me hunger to be there. This is a, an extract from a letter from Mary Stella Edwards to Judith Ackland. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Burton Art Gallery and Museum, we are situated in Biddeford, North Devon. We opened in the early 1950s as an art gallery and then redeveloped into an art gallery museum in the 1980s and we're celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. Yay. Um, Judith Ackland and Mary Stella Edwards have a very much intertwined history with Biddeford, North Devon and the Burton, which Jana's kind of covered beautifully. Um, Judith Ackland was the daughter of the town's doctor um, and as such was born and lived all of her life at Stoford House on the Strand in Biddeford. Both were members of Biddeford and Westwood Ho Art Society and were involved with the gallery 
from its conception in the 1950s. Diaries talk of um, their hanging and invigilating the summer exhibitions and when it was held at the Burton as well as at the, um, the art college um, and then visiting numerous um, exhibitions when they came up. Go to the next slide please. Um, after Judith's death, Mary Stella held memorial exhibitions which toured and featured both Judith's paintings and the models. I'm very excited to see the model that you've got because we have lots of examples of that model in the collection. So I'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> these were held at the Burton, South Moulton, Staines where Mary Stella lived and at Ram. Um, and in the early 1980s, Mary Stella bequeathed a large collection of watercolours, drawings and models to the gallery, which included watercolours by both artists, mostly the subjects were Bucks Mills, but also portraits and works from their sketching tours, which they took in Wales um, and in the Lake District. And it, you could do the next couple of slides. Um, so this is Judith Ackland um, reading. A lot of the work that we have if you look very closely at it, you will find a little figure and it will usually either be, it will usually be Judith Ackland. So at some point in the watercolors, you will, they will feature in them. Um, if you do the next one. So this is on pole rock. So this pole, which features in quite a lot of their photographs and paintings is actually a marker so that when the fishermen came in, they would know where to pull the boats in but it became really a big feature for them in the paintings because it's such a significant, it sticks up for miles and they would swim around it and everything. Um, so in 2013, the Ackland and Edward Trust set up after Mary Stella's death, um, deposited the Ackland and Edward archive with the Burton, an archive I've had the pleasure to work with um, for about seven years now, first as a volunteer and for the past three years as a member of staff. Um, could do the next slide. Recently, we have been combining the archive's content with artworks and objects for our Reading Between the Lines series of exhibitions, which have focused on their relationship with the cabin at Bucks Mills. Combining extracts from the diary and letters with their work has proved very popular. We are only beginning to scratch the surface of the archive. There is still a lot of work to be done to fully understand its significance and its content. Go to the next one. Mary Stella Edwards is most familiar to us um, as it's her archive that underpins the whole of our collection and the work that we've been doing at the Burton with exhibitions and displays. Her self-edited diaries and letters give a real sense of her personality, which is brilliant, and the importance of her identity as a professional artist, both as a painter and as a poet. We discovered that she was a consummate networker. She travelled regularly from Staines to London, both before, during and after the Second World War. She, with a portfolio in hand, she visited publishers and galleries, building sometimes lifelong relationships through her hunt for work for the pair. She was very determined and found them both work do, doing um, book cover designs, illustrations, chocolate box covers, we've had those mentioned, and even calendars. <laughs> which they did for exhibitions. Um, not only did they paint and illustrate, but Mary Stella published five volumes of um, poems and walked the streets of London looking for publishers for these and other works by the pair. So it wasn't just the poem, she was also writing stories that we have some of the manuscripts for and she was trying to get those published at the same time. The next slide, please. Oh, if everyone, yeah. Judith Ackland is the quieter voice within the archive. Though we have a few of her diaries, she's not a diary writer. Um, entries are sparse and mostly relate to her Jacanda work in the 1950s. Her letters are not as frequent as Mary Stella's, but are packed with information on how things are going in Biddeford at home and her work. Judith also studied at Regent Street in London, where she met Mary Stella. But due to her sister Madeline's sudden illness, she didn't stay for very long, having to go back home to Biddeford to care for her sister. And she only returned for a few months after her sister's death before going back to Biddeford with her parents permanently. 
Um, both relied heavily on letters and wrote exhaustively to each other, Mary updating Judith with feedback and Judith with progress reports and how work was going. They shared ideas, pictures and gifts through daily letters between the 1920s and the end of the war. We discovered that they ha even had a cryptic postcard system during the Second World War, which allowed Mary, living close to London, um, the ability to share with Judith whether or not she'd had a good or bad night during the air raid. Both had elderly parents and it's apparent that both Mary Stella and Judith took on caring roles for them in their later lives. This kept both at home and is perhaps what made sketching tours and visits to Biddeford, Staines and Vuxmill so important to the pair. If you do the next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> the cabin. From our exhibition work, partial transcriptions of Mary Stella Edwards and Judith Axon's correspondence, diaries and photographs, alongside previously unseen paintings by the two artists of Bucks Mills and The Cabin. This has all allowed us to show the deep-seated importance of Bucks Mills to, uh, to the interesting cu the couple and their work. It became very clear from the outset that this was a special place to both Mary Stella and Judith. Prior to Mary Stella's first visit there with Judith in the mid 1920s, we found that Judith's family through her mother had been renting the cabin as a family getaway, much like today's holiday homes. And it's very evident from her diaries that Mary Stella fell in love with the place as soon as she arrived. So if I read this quote for you, it says, the walls of random rubble plastered and whitewashed, the windows in the stove corner looking to Clavelli, the sly defiance of the hole challenging the sea, the sweep of the rays of sunlight and starlight and storm, with a wave sending spray to the top of the slip, and Ernest Braun with his son and the last of the fishermen whose fleet of 16 boats once lined the beach, standing motionless against the dark sea, facing at what he loves most in the world, are part of my life forever. The couple saw the cabin as their island home, and much like their rare sketching and painting tours to Wales in the Lake District, they used the cabin as a retreat. If you could do the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is Judith painting at the cabin. I think we have um, a copy at the Burton of the watercolour that she's actually painting in this one. And lots of their pictures involve either of the two of them painting or sketching. They're very good at taking pictures that involve themselves in their artistic practice. We have a lot of them. Um, Mary's diaries detailed how they would go back and forth between different spots, painting and picnicking along the beach, the cliffs, fields and woods, going back to the cabin to read, sleep and catch up on the finer points of their paintings when the weather was bad. Her diaries also show how the cabin greatly influenced her poetry, inspiring her to write. Okay, next slide. This is Mary Stella above um, Bucks Mill Village. It turns out that through um, reading a lot of the diaries, or parts of the diaries are trying to transcribe them, it's very difficult handwriting, um, that they had the names and local names for different areas on it. So it's been very interesting trying to reveal which areas, which part of the diary relates to, or which areas the work of art that they're referring to refers to. It's a bit like a cryptic crossword. Um, where did I get that? Mary's diaries detail how they know letters between the two prior to visits are filled with delightful lists of provisions needed and work they were to accomplish while they were there. So that was work that Mary Stella would bring back from London. Judith would write about cabin preparations and her visits to the cabin and getting the place habitable, sealing holes in the water butt or fitting blackout curtains during the war. There was no electricity or heating and it's very much open to the elements. Repairs were often needed and Judith took the responsibility for doing this, though it's very evident that both of them saved money from painting sales to accomplish most of the repairs to the cottages. Mary Stella would alight at Biddeford train station, it's very romantic, and the pair would bus down to Bucks Mills and walk down to the village. They would often walk the coastal pass between Biddeford and Bucks Mills or catch the bus to Biddeford to get supplies. They would stay for about a month, maybe two, and mostly in the summer season, but they would also do a month or two in between, depending on how busy they were. 
have next slide, please. I think this um, quote really sums up how it influenced Mary Stella's poetry, the environment, and her, how the first visit there really captured her spirit. I find I've written at the rate of a poem per month since we were at Bucks, which is exactly double my output for each year of the three years before that. You said that you had a hope that Bucks would make me write, but it is you and the place together. I think that kind of is self-explanatory. Um, In 1948, sorry, could you do the next slide for me? In 1948, Judith and Mary Stella managed to buy at auction their cabin. Letters show that they had been planning and worrying about this for months prior, both saving up all their money and even selling, selling jewellery that they had finally in October, we get this diary entry. Could you do the next one? We are one, the cottage is ours, as it has always been and would be in spirit. Our work on the archive at the Burton is far from complete, but we have reached a point now where we are beginning to put together an outline of their lives and uncover more about their everyday existence, both together and apart. When it first come, came in, the archive was 13 boxes, all different sizes, all different materials, filled with letters, folders, photographs, works of art, all in jumbled up and together in no particular order. And it has taken all this time, it's a very long time, one day a week, <laughs> to shift through it and put it into some kind of order. We are now at a point where we are able to understand the extent of what both Mary Stella and Judith Ackland have achieved and how hard as artists they worked and often male driven workplace. We are about to also publish um, a website uh, through the Ackland and Edward Trust soon, um, which should be live hopefully by the end of this year. Um, and we are working on a new display which will help to re kind of tell their story because we've had a display up since 1992. So that's recently gone down and we're now developing a new one which can hopefully encapsulate the wonderful story of them, their lives, all that they have accomplished, because they were the most proficient artists, I think, that I have ever met, both with the, the writing, the stories, the children's books, in some cases, the illustrations, the paintings, the <laughs> they didn't really, and at the same time, they were caring for their parents. <laughs> it was really great. <laughs> if you could do the next slide, this will show you this is two of our lovely volunteers who come in um, every Wednesday. Well, they haven't been able to come in um, over the COVID period, as we call it, but they're now really happy to be back in transcribing them, though they're not entirely happy with Mary Stella Edwards' handwriting because it's very difficult to read. <laughs> um, this was done for when we did the, the last um, Ackland and Edwards Reading Between the Lines exhibition. And they're very proud of the picture and we're very proud of them. If you could do the next slide. So this is me. This is if anybody wants to get in contact with me and um, anything to do with the new website will go through our Instagram or it will go through the Burton Archive. We're very good on social media. So it will be up on there. And I hope that's been OK. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. I mean, huge thank you for that talk. I was going to try to stop sharing the slides. Yes, that was so interesting. I mean, just I think you've given us such a wonderful glimpse into their life and work and also just that kind of process of working with an archive um, and working through that and discovering different aspects. I thought it was so, so interesting. So thank you so much. I'm sure there's loads of questions which we can talk about later on, but thank you so much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Emma Wallace, who's going to talk about the queer ecological aspects of, of the work. So over to you, Emma. Sorry, thank you, Yana. I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, oh, it's taking me back. Oops, sorry. <laughs> No problem, take your time. <laughs> this is always Zoom. <laughs> but it is working. I see the slides. 
Yeah, I'm trying to, oh, how do I get them? I think slideshow possibly, and then share. Oh, I think it's because my tab is at the very top. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> so yeah, as Jan is saying, um, my primary interest throughout um, the entire project has been in the role that queer ecology, but more generally kind of landscape, space and place plays in a lot of um, the kind of objects and the ways in which kind of queer, queer history, queer desire, queer love is kind of formulated and it has the kind of direct interaction with the natural world. Um, so when I was first looking through, sorry, <laughs> when I was first looking through the catalogue, I was obviously quite drawn to Judith Ackman's landscape paintings. Um, they are beautiful in and of themselves, even without me having this kind of prior interest in kind of the work, the role that place and landscape plays. So I've just got four that I've got today to show. Um, there are many, many more, but I could talk more generally about the paintings and what I love about them. I love the kind of use of colour. I like how there's this kind of hazy sheen to them. And when I first looked at them, they almost reminded me of kind of like, I don't know, a half remembered image from a sort of past summer. Um, sort of having been, having studied at Exeter and having been based sort of in the surrounding area and had the opportunity to explore. These are kind of landscapes that always be fairly familiar to me, but kind of looking at these paintings allowed me to see them almost kind of a new and I was kind of interested in the way in which yeah the kind of role that place plays and actually I really enjoyed that diary extract that you just read out Nicole about um I can't remember the exact words about Bucks and something about the place and Judith both being kind of like this inspiring force uh in so kind of the production of that art I'm kind of really interested in that role that kind of nature plays sort of grounding this art and their lives within the natural world and what that plays um, I think my personal favourite is the dark pool, which is just featured there. Um, I love the kind of interactions of the kind of dark colours with the golden with the golden tones, and how it sort of gives it almost this sort of ethereal quality, I suppose. Um, and this got me thinking when I was sort of initially thinking, okay, I'm interested in this, and I'm also interested in the role that place plays. Um, and over lockdown, I have been doing a lot more watching of films and videos and one of the things I noticed is how much this kind of reoccurred this kind of interest this visual interest in the natural world and kind of situating um, these kind of stories of queer love and queer history within the kind of natural world um, unfortunately I couldn't get a picture of Summerland next to a coast but there is a coast that plays quite a sort of significant part in the kind of visual cinematography it's not necessarily always like a background um, image it sort of feels as powerful and as as direct and kind of primary of force and focus of interest as the characters themselves and I'm kind of interested in how that kind of the film expresses quite all three films, um, similar to the paintings I found, sort of expresses kind of climatological concern. The natural forces almost became a way of expressing, they were kind of a vehicle of expression for these characters, their explorations, their own desire, their own sexuality. Um, and I was kind of interested in how nature has that sort of opportunity to be a space where different ideas, different feelings, different moods can be ventilated and explored. Um, and I found it also, um, I sort of <laughs> jump around from lots of different things, but I also noticed that this kind of reoccurring use of natural imagery um, as well in kind of uh, literature that's often focusing on queer love and queer history. So I've just got three examples on the board, one from Written on the Body by Jeanette Winterson, where she describes the character's body as smelling of rock pools we filled each day with fresh tides of longing, um, as well as two fragments of Sappho. Um, using natural imagery and natural motifs is by no means original, especially within literature. It is a common idea as a way to express romantic love. But I was interested in the way in which, I don't know, it felt to me the way that nature has been used within all of these kind of pieces of art that I've just referenced. It didn't necessarily feel, I don't know, nature sometimes feels almost like this solipsistic variant within some kinds of poetry. But this one, it almost feels independent of the characters, but as powerful a force that parallels them in their lives. And I'm kind of interested in the way in which in all of these um, pieces of art, especially in the films I just referenced, but also potentially in the, in the paintings as well, the Judith Ackman paintings, sort of the ideas in which 
by situating these stories within these kind of natural scenes, within these kind of very powerful elemental forces, it kind of suggests the way in which queer love and queer history is as elemental and timeless. There's a way in which these two forces are connected. Um, and I really enjoyed as well, Jana reading out the poetry. I didn't realize that Mary Stella Edwards had such a massive interest in time and the role that time and timelessness plays. And when I was thinking about this, these kind of wider sort of more cultural ideas in relation to queer ecology, which is something that I've already engaged with um, on a different level with my interest in kind of Mary Anning and fossils and paleontology. Um, queer ecology in its very simplest term means like a series of practices which aims to reimagine nature, biology and sexuality in light of queer theory. Um, it sort of allows us to disrupt very heterosexist notions of nature. So the theorist Foucault lays out this idea of biopower, um, which is this idea that modern regimes uh, came to conceive of sex as a specific object of scientific knowledge, organized through both a biology of reproduction, which considered human sexual behavior in relation to the psychologies of plant and animal reproduction, and a medicine of sex, which conceived of human sexuality in terms of desire and identity. So this is kind of idea of trying to define what is natural, what is seemingly, um, yeah, organic, natural, and using this kind of policing nature, essentially, because if you interrogate closer, um, the idea of kind of animal and plant reproduction kind of supporting this idea of the biology of reproduction is actually quite erroneous. It doesn't follow necessarily that way, um, but it's this kind of idea and the way in which kind of nature is policed. Um, I know Judith Butler, who's a kind of pioneer of gender studies, uh, she makes a case for queer ecology. She sort of says that these sort of heterosexist gender performances um, that kind of society um, encourages us to perform and engage with kind of produces this manifold that kind of separates inside from outside, this kind of separation of inside and outside. It's kind of from fundamental for thinking about nature is this kind of very closed off sort of metaphysical system, sort of this nature as this pure closed system, um, sort of the way in which by virtue of that sort of there's a tendency to view queer love and desires not only against nature but as a symptom of the kind of toxic underside um, of industrial urban and increasingly cosmopolitan modernity seen as something distinctly against nature um, but as i said it, queer ecology almost allows us to liberate ourselves from that viewpoint which is essentially false if you interrogate close enough. I mean Darwin's theory of evolution essentially proposes that life forms are essentially made from each other. We're sort of mutually determining entities, we exist in relation to one another, we derive from each other. There's a way in which we need to sort of let these boundaries, the boundaries that we prop up to kind of give our sen ourselves a sense of delineation, they don't actually fall through. Um, so queer ecology enables us to conceive of an infinite number of possible natures and lives. It's concerned with possibility, with the idea of what could be rather than just assuming something. So um, with my interest in Mary Anning and queer paleontology, I was sort of thinking about it in relation to the tensions that have been that have emerged with the idea that the film's depiction of queer love between Mary Anning and um, oh, I, forgot, I forgot Saoirse Ronan's uh, name in the, in the film, but the two characters um, and the idea that somehow because it is speculative, it's intrinsically anachronistic and actually the ways in which that it, it almost misses the point, the idea of sort of the way in which you kind of engage with the world and kind of allow yourself to shed away all those misassumptions you've made, not only about the natural world, but also about history and who is and who or what or what love or what kind of relationships are natural and queer ecology allows us to kind of reformulate those kind of received views that we have um and i've got a couple i've got a quote sort of about life constituting a kind of mesh sort of similar to what i was saying about darwin the idea that we are indelibly bound up with each other um and i think one of the most interesting things about introducing this idea of queer ecology and thinking about how um, it, it sort of allows us to sort of think about um, the ways in which uh, sexuality and gender has been policed is kind of finding that correlation, the ways in which people find correlations and the stories and the paintings I've just listed. There's a way in which they are, they seem to be in confluence with each other, the role of the natural world, the role of landscape, the role of queer ecology and these stories and the ways in which it allows us to perhaps think the sort of 
so I'll read out the quote, but by analysing how discourses of nature have been used to enforce heteronormativity, to police sexuality and to punish and exclude those persons who have been deemed sexually transgressive, we can begin to understand the deep underlying commonalities between struggles against sexual oppression and other struggles for environmental justice. So at the end of that kind of theoretical train, sort of bringing it back to um, the paintings I was interested in, I'm sort of intrigued with sort of the ways in which, yeah, the, I, I didn't realize that there were paintings where Judith Ackland um, or Mary Stella Edwards did feature, but I really love that as a sort of little detail, but I'm interested in how they were so deeply grounded in the landscape and the landscape seemed to be almost like a character within these paintings, even if you couldn't necessarily see the sort of smaller figures within that. And what that kind of speaks to, I mean, it feels quite a modern and contemporary concern now about our sort of treatment of the environment and the ways in which that speaks to other issues that we have, other forms of oppression that exist. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of interested in sort of what are the possibilities, what are our, how far can we push these imaginative possibilities if we think about these two in relation with one another? So, <laughs> that was a lot, I know, and a lot of theory, but... Uh, <laughs> That is, that was my piece. Sorry, I don't have a, I forgot to put a follow on slide. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you so much, Emma. I think this is such a rich and fascinating talk. And I think the bigger points you raise are so important about, I think the way in which queerness and also queer people have often been positioned against nature. Mm -hmm. And personally, I found it really meaningful to go to like natural places associated with queer figures. Um, in, across the southwest really and kind of using that as a way of connecting with nature when you've often felt excluded from those places mm. so that sense of developing a sense of place really resonated with me um, and I think it's also I mean your work has been so interesting on the project and Frankie and other researchers have done other work on yeah queer ecology and really reclaiming the natural world as a as mm. a potentially queer site so I absolutely love that work and it's so interesting and also interesting to think about the recent films that, that have been doing similar mm. work so thank you so, so much, Emma. This was really brilliant. And again, we have time for questions later on. Can you stop sharing your slides? Yeah, excellent. Now we're back because now I'm going to share my slides again. But over to you, Helen, for your talk. Thank you. Um, so, it, well, it's like everyone, it's wonderful to be here and to find so many other people who are interested in Mary Stella and Judith Ackland. And so my interest really began with the love of the building, which you might just be able to see behind you there. And also the beach at Bucks Mills, although that's not very representative because it's actually a very um, rocky beach rather than um, a sandy one. But my interest began with the love of the building, their summer studio, the cabin, which I hope Jana will put another picture up of. And um, I, can, I kind of feel like you can never, never see too many pictures of the cabin. And I first saw the cabin on a family holiday when I was five. And by the time I was 18, I had romantic and unrealistic visions of making it my home. Dreams which, to be honest, have never really gone away. It was only much later, 35 years later to be exact, that I became interested in Mary's poems. In particular, the collection Before and After, which she published in memory of Judith. We all have before and after moments in our lives, a day when everything changes forever. For Mary, it was the 6th of June, 1971, the day that Judith died. When I first read Mary's writing, I was in a state of shocked grief. A much, much too young member of my family had just died and the poems and the cabin somehow gave me a focus, something I was to hold on to through two more unexpected family deaths. I thought about those before and after moments and began researching a work of non-fiction to weave my own, and just as importantly, other people's memories and responses to the cabin and to Mary and Judith's lives and art into a story. And within all of this, it's really been Mary's poems that have kind of led my way. So I'd like to read an extract from my work in progress, which is of course called The Cabin. This isn't the opening but it's fairly near the start. Every time I come back to the cabin, it is the same and it is different. I'm never quite prepared for its energy or its undertow. Like a ship without a crew, it feels adrift. The National Trust website says that when Judith died in 1971, Mary never used their seaside studio again. The cabin was frozen in time. This may or may not be completely true, 
but it holds great power. It's impossible not to treat each object as an artifact. I pick up a small glass bottle full of shiny paper coils, red, gold, silver, blue and green, and wonder whether Mary's fingers or Judith's fingers or both together twisted these toffee wrapper rings. I turn the bottle onto its side and give it a tap. The hoops barely move, but they throw some of their light into the gloom. I'm not the only person to search for clues in the cabin. The poet Simon Armitage visited for a few hours in 2014, whilst on his 630 mile walk around the southwest coast path. I had been inside the cabin before Armitage. In the 1980s, my mother discovered it was possible to borrow a key, but I was never here for long and never by myself. So it was Armitage's book, Walking Away, which told me that somewhere in this building, there is a tiny pair of reading glasses with Judith Ackland's name written by hand on the inside of the case. Glasses which I find amongst a jumble of paints and brushes in an upstairs wicker basket. I have three pairs of my sister Joy's glasses, the two she used for sewing, knitting and reading, and the black sunnies she wore on our last day at the sea. I do not know what to do with these glasses, but then nor did her children. So when we cleared the house, I brought them back to my home. I understand why Mary might have left Judith's glasses in the cabin. And yet even as I photograph them, even as I wonder what I will write about them, I worry about their past and their future. Years and years of being peered at by strangers, strangers like you, strangers like me. I hear a male voice calling outside. The door moved, it might be an open day. I'm coming, I'm coming. A woman is puffing closer. I'm up the stairs, out of sight, before they can unlatch the garden gate. I feel absurd, not so much artist in residence as writer in hiding. I slow my breath. The stone walls are thick, but the panes of glass are thin, and wind blows under doors, between sashes, through keyholes. Judith and Mary must have heard everything, not just the sea, which is low this morning, both in tide and voice, and the waterfall, which sounds surprisingly distant, given it's less than 50 metres away. But the robin on the railings, the chaffinch in the tree, the flurry of blue tits working their way along the cliff, and the humans, always the humans. It doesn't look locked, but something's holding it fast. He's right. I swiveled the piece of wood, nailed to the door frame, around like a windmill, and left it horizontal. But it isn't strong or well secured. Footsteps circle the building. Probably one of those artists. We might find them on the beach. The woman sounds nice, understanding, hopeful. I could still appear, welcome them in, but I do not feel up to explaining myself. I have no art to show. I stand still with my guilt, waiting for them to go away. The spider's webs are amazing. Last week it was Halloween and every other cafe was draped with cobwebs and decorated with oversized arachnids. The cabin is dressed in miniature and includes prey. Dried up flies litter surfaces. Strands of spider silk run from dirty glass to peeling frames. These are not intricate spiral orbs pinned up for a party. They are hammock style funnels designed for maximum snarl and snare. It isn't just the flies which are dead. The spiders themselves seem to have given up. A shriveled brown body a centimetre long, lies on the mantelpiece, five spindly legs folded up and under, three outstretched limbs almost ready for action. Mary does not write of spiders or flies in her poetry, but there is one insect she favours which appears in her poem, Defeat. It could be anywhere, but I imagine it on this bedroom windowsill. Perhaps it flew in when the cabin door was open and became trapped when she went out painting with Judith. It's dated 1966 in her collection, A Truce with Time, and begins. The bee that sought its exit through the pain, day long perhaps in puzzled hope renewed, will not the sun of morning feel again, or shake the foxglove bells, its little feud with powers invisible has been in vain. The spiders don't have the same pathos or innocence that Mary goes on to write about. 
nor the thwarted sense of industry. Her bee dies seeking still ungathered honey. These dead spiders have a larder full of trussed up flies. I prod at a collection of legs, bigger and thicker than the limbs on the mantelpiece. Nothing moves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Someone wrote in the chat, and I absolutely agree, such beautiful language in this reading, very evocative. Thank you so much. And the glass is so moving, absolutely. Well, no, you. I absolutely love your, your work, and it's so interesting. And I'm so glad that we are kind of connecting through this event. I mean, one thing that really resonates with me personally, I guess also as someone who works on archives and who works on histories of sexuality is the sense of the cabin as a place of, of, of imagination and fantasy and queer possibility, but then also the slightly like voyeuristic sense and what is my role in this? And am I doing the right thing in looking and staring and digging up stories that might not be for me or might not be mine? And I think that's so interesting how you capture that, that ambivalence. So I'm sure again, there's loads of questions which we can uh, explore and discuss later. But I think there's a really nice link now to Natalie's work as someone who has just visited the cavern and is responding creatively to this, this wonderful, rich, interesting, difficult in some ways place. But thank you so much, Helen. It's so, such a privilege really to listen to your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone who's uh, who's spoken and shared thoughts. It, I've been writing loads of notes. It's really fascinating, and it's really interesting the way different people are framing things. And so, the, uh, Nicole, we might have to talk about some dates. So, you, what you might find with what I'm sharing are some. I don't always deal with accuracy, so just to bear that in mind. <laughs> Um, but it, I, you know, it, it really thank you. Very generous um, responses from everybody. Just, I think we've seen a couple of times one painting called "The Cabin from the Shore, Low Tide," and it's an Ackland painting. And just to, uh, it's maybe we might revisit it in the the Q and A. But just, I've just had that one painting kind of in mind. Um, and the, the writing I'm about to share is part of a wider collection of writing that I'm doing as part of the project, as part of my writer in residence at RAM. And this, this is very new and it's very raw and I'm trying to find my way through. So, so I've been trying to write about Judith and Mary, staring at photographs of their paintings, waiting for an invitation. Listening in to these paintings that inhabit a certain amount of space. Space that has been carefully curated, measured, chosen, framed and fixed, placed amongst others so we can witness them, peer in online and in a gallery. But I think it's the spaces within the space that I'm looking for, waiting for the colours and contours to reach me. And seeing Judith and Mary's paintings live at Ram Storage Facility, the Ark was a step towards this, a trick under mediated light as colour bounced off preserved canvases, small and delicate lines interwoven and forged. I saw detail, beauty, skill, unfiltered, unframed. And I swear I could smell the seaweed and the ocean in their brush strokes. So I started to follow where their eyes followed, going to Bucks Mills and standing in the landscape that they painted, bursting with a panoramic multitude, connecting to the light, to the colours, rock formations that held them, their attention over five decades, allowed me to observe, experience what drew them to the expansiveness of what feels like a geolog geological epicentre. The, the landscape is incredible if you'll ever get to go to Bucks Mills. And so something, 
has begun to take hold. Although the paintings did do a pretty good job in alerting me to this, to the enormity of the landscape. So walking through Bucks Mills Village with the anticipation of meeting the cabin where Judith and Mary lived, cared for one another, dedicated themselves to their craft was exhilarating. Here I was on the hunt looking for new clues, trying to find them, asking why this particular place? Why are we drawn to what we are drawn to and to who we are drawn to? It felt like a sanctuary from car park to ocean's edge. Water in some form at all times a companion. And walking down towards the cabin was like walking back in time to another past, one that doesn't feel like it has changed a huge amount in the last hundred years. 1921, an arrival. Two women stand on the shore. 2021, 100 years later, I stand on the shore. The surprise of an artist being in residence as I visit the cabin, thinking I'll only walk round its architecture and being able to go inside. I stood looking out of one of the upper windows into the blue, saw another time, another place. The cabin, J dot A and M dot S dot E above the door for all to see. A declaration of presence, not absence. Visibility, not invisibility. Side by side declaring we were here. Reminding me of a chant often heard on pride marches. We're here, we're queer. Words from beyond their lifetime out of reach. And so looking out of the small building and the world that opens up and the vista that takes control of your senses. My vision exploded as sea met sky out of these tiny windows as air hit the window pane, I can only imagine how everything changes so much in that view on a daily basis. At this edge land, the edge of a county, the edge of a country, the edge of something infinite and unfathomable. Geology and sea guiding the eye, light bouncing off something prehistoric and the rock formations split my vision from this former fisherman's store. So I'm looking for the different layers, the layers of sediment, like layers of sediment that is formed between two people as the years strip back and away, as life moves forward and the world lights up, shifts, tectonic plates collide. A life in a cabin gets frozen in time on a North Devon shore where they stood like rocks in an ever moving landscape, revisiting it time and time again. Here other artists have stood, imagining them there, conjuring. I begin to imagine them there. But it was only when I stood on the shore I started to look for them. I found myself standing in one of Judith's paintings, the cabin from the shore, low tide. Here, I am an absence, obscured from vision, never in that frame, never in their view. There, I know I'm always at a distance, always going to be reaching in. I thought about this painting that has a new emotional depth for me now after standing in the middle of it 
standing inside their cabin, framed by the doorway, having walked down the steepness to the shore over pebbles and boulders and ancient rocks that move below the surface when the water is high. Having stood in the sea with my back to the distance, as they would have done, looking up to the cabin, hearing sounds of a coastal waterfall cascading in never ending motion. Water escaping the heart of woodlands, hugging cliff tops. The coastline as constant as they were. I wonder if they loved the exchange of that sound of waterfall and sea as much as I did. It was here I imagined seeing them standing by the cabin, waving out to sea, waving out to me as I rolled up my trousers, took off my socks and shoes, planted myself in water, gently giving me motion, making me more than a rock standing still. I am moved watching out for them, waiting for a glimpse. And then there they are. How many times did they wave to one another? One on the shore, one from the cabin, searching in the light, in the half light, amidst thunder and mist and rain, calling out, tea is in the pot. Judith and Mary, together as they walk along this Bucks Mill shore, cultivating a language between them and ever persistent tides, a language of sky, sea, air and rock, a language of water, never still, then roaming along the water's edge, time after time, laying their own geological foundations. A life of blood and bone, china and paint, feathers and shells, coffee pots, teapots, stairs where chairs hang hidden from the hall, corners full of crockery, a lamp waiting to be lit, a stove waiting to be warmed, toast needed for the rack, glue and glasses, paint brushes, a grater now rusted, a bottle opener hanging above a wood burner, one floor up a bed in a corner, coat hangers all in a row, a lopsided armchair with a tartan rug, a mirror above a mantle, two egg cups, an old iron, one rug on the floor, oven gloves in a wicker basket, heeled shoes still in boxes, possibly never worn, and a candlestick, jars used once long ago, now empty, and stairs climbed a thousand times, binoculars used, plates, a glass jelly mould, a wash bowl and a jug framed by a window. Then walking canes hung from the back of a door. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thanks. So beautiful. Um, Helen wrote in the chat, I love your image of you being in that painting, Nat, the intimate things such as oven gloves and eggs cups that are so evocative. And Helen Kent wrote, I love your thought of why we are drawn to the places we are drawn to and the people we are drawn to. Beautiful. Yes, I absolutely agree. I mean, so much of that resonated with me and this idea of how we find ourselves in our queer histories and the distance and the absence and how we navigate those. And also the liminality of the cabin between, as you say, car park and ocean. And yeah, really, really beautiful. I mean, so much to pick up on. Um, and I can't wait to read it and talk to you about it more. But we have 15 minutes left, so I'm going to open it up to questions. But before I do that, just thank you again to all of the speakers. I think there's so many interesting resonances across all of these talks and presentations and just a real joy and privilege to listen to all of you. So thank you so much.